All right, today we're gonna to talk about some of the original research pieces we put out on the Validia blog and also some of the um, top articles that we came across for the week of January 22nd, 2021. Um, so to start, Jack, you wrote a article around the basics of momentum investing. So do you wanna sort of give a summary of what you were talking about there? Sure. I don't know if you find this, but I, I find that I'm much more attracted to value. You know, if, if you look at the factors that work over time, value and momentum stand above all the other ones. But for some reason, I'm more attracted to value. And so I tend to want to overweight value in my investment strategy. I'm not, do you find that with yourself as well? I mean, I guess I've toggled over the years. I think I was initially more of a value investor, but just by understanding some of the models on Validia and looking at the long-term performance and thinking about how they've how momentum has actually helped contribute in some ways to the performance i think that momentum can be very sort of powerful in a lot of ways when investing so i'm kind of half and half i mean i i do tend to i do tend to like um i think internally feel like value makes more sense to me but when i see momentum used in the context of sort of the systematic strategies i certainly see a lot of benefit to it yeah, so you're doing a better job than I am, but uh, but my my goal this week was to basically start from the top and explain momentum and, and any you know explain everything going on with momentum. Start with why does momentum work? How is momentum implemented? What are the ways that you measure momentum? You know, what are the pros and cons of momentum? So my my goal with the article was just to take a a look at all the basics of using a momentum strategy and how it is actually implemented in the real world, and then look at some of the downsides too in terms of some of the things you're gonna you might struggle with if you follow a momentum strategy. And we're going to have Jack Vogel. This is kind of a plug for our, our other podcast, but we're going to have Jack Vogel of um, Alpha Architect on in a few weeks to talk momentum investing. So I, I'm really looking forward to that discussion because he's he's a co-author of Quantitative Momentum with Wes Gray, and he's just kind of a resident expert on momentum investing. So that should be a good one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that book is a lot of what we've learned about momentum came from that book. You know, for instance, we talk about, you know, I talk about in the article how they found that when momentum is consistent, it, it's a much better signal. So if, if you have a stock that's had a smooth run up, that's a, that's a much better stock to invest in than one that's like a biotech that's had you know a huge run in one day. So we, we've learned a lot from that book uh, as well as some other research papers. And, and I talk about that in the article. Yeah. For um, our podcast, you and I talked about dividends and sort of the highlights with that is, you know, we were kind of talking about how a lot of investors um, have dividends very high on the importance list. A lot of investors want income from their portfolios. Um, the dividend yield in the market has been falling over time, but we sort of talked about how, you know, there's other things that you should maybe be looking at as an investor, like shareholder yield, which incorporates buybacks and dividends. And we also discussed this idea of, um, and by the way, the long-term evidence sort of su supports from a, a performance standpoint that just, investing based solely on yield is not the optimal way to go. There's better ways like including shareholder yield. Um, and that was research that we kind of pulled from O'Shaughnessy's book, What Works on Wall Street. But we sort of concluded with talking about a synthetic dividend and how for some investors, it might be better to actually sell part of their portfolio to meet their income needs rather than just solely going after the highest yielding stocks in the market. Yeah, you know, everybody wants dividends. Investors love dividends, and, and it's great that companies return capital to shareholders, but it's also important to take a step back when you follow any investment strategy and say, why am I doing this? Does this make sense? And so when you take a step back with dividends, you know, people buy dividends for two reasons, or buy dividend paying stocks for two reasons. One is because they want income in their portfolio, and two is they have a belief that those types of stocks are going to outperform the market over time. And so we took a look in the in the podcast and looked at each one of those and said, is there a better way to do it? Is there a better way to produce the money I need to spend in retirement than using dividends? Is there a better way to produce the outperformance over the market I'm looking for than dividends? And so I think we found that there probably is. And that's, I mean, people can listen to the podcast if they want to get into all the details, but that was the overall goal of it. I know you're chomping at the bit to uh, talk about this Arna article on value, <laughs> so go for it. <laughs> Well, anything that says value investing is back and that we're in for a huge run, that's that's basically what I'm looking for. So if anybody else has got that, send it to me, we'll get it published. Um, but, you know, it, it is good when someone like Arnott says it because he is obviously one of the leading, you know, the leading people in this field of quantitative investing. And he has looked at the long term data and, you know, he feels like this is really one of the best opportunities he's seen in his career to invest in value stocks. And so, you know, the, there was a couple of things that I took from it is. You know, one is when he just to, to get at what I was just saying, what he said is the bottom line is I think this is the better this 
this is a better time to be a value investor than any time in my career. I look back at the tech bubble and I never thought I would see valuation stress the way it stretched the way they were. We're back to that and then some. So, and, and that's what our data shows as well. I mean, our, our data shows it's not as, you know, we're not in the 0.1 percentile, you know, with our valuation relative to growth because we have had a run here since the coronavirus, but we're in the fifth percentile. So value is still exceptionally cheap relative to growth. And if you're a believer that history is a guide here, then every other time this has happened, you've gotten great performance from value. Now, obviously there's a case to be made that things are different every single time. And this time that might not happen. But what he's saying is if you look at the historical data, this is probably a great time to invest in value. What was your favorite article this week? Yeah, it was an article from the New York Times. This is not going to be, I think, a surprise to most people that listen to us, but it was an article about how clueless Wall Street analysts are with their forecasts for the coming year. So um, this article was from mid-December when you had all the market commentators, all the guys that are like market strategists, basically giving their year-end 2021 S&P targets. And the article was really just talking about how off these guys are each and every year. So, you know, there's some st statistics in here that um, I think in, uh, it was funny. I, he used this, and this is a, this is a great way to think about it. So in December of 2019, the median consensus Wall Street um, estimate for the S&P 500 was the S&P was going to rise 2.7% for 2020. We, we know that the market was up about 15%. And I, I don't even think this is including dividends of 15%. But yeah, I think it is 15 to 16%, give or take something like that for your, you know, where the market actually ended in 2020. And so he says, you know, imagine if you're listening to a weatherman who tells you it's going to snow two inches tomorrow, but yet you wake up and there's 15 inches of snow. Like that weatherman would basically be fired. And so that's how wrong that these guys are. And it's not just one year. They're consistently off. I think some of the statistics are by about 12% each and every year. And one of the things that we know about the market's return is that you may average over the very long term, a 10% annualized return in the market, let's say over a 20 or 30 year period. But the variability, you know, in those returns, I think the market has like a 14% standard deviation. So that means, you know, a very large percentage of the time, the market can be up 24% or maybe down by 2%. That's, you know, where you're going to mostly land. So there's a lot of variability in those annual returns. And kind of the bottom line is you just probably shouldn't be putting too much weight in these uh, market yeah, and I don't even blame these guys for doing it. I mean, if, if you or I were given millions of dollars at a major investment bank and said, give us your year-end target for the S&P, I'll give you that thing down to one point if you want it. It'll be completely wrong, but I'll give it to you. Um, so this is their job. I mean, they're asked to do this and they're asked to try to predict the future. It's just, it's our job as investors to say they're trying, although they're using their, you know, this, they're obviously giving their best intentions with this, they're trying to do something that's impossible. No one can predict what's going to happen in the market in any given 12 month period. And if you want to, you sort of reference the coronavirus. If you want to come up, come up with an example, use that because not only were all the estimates wrong for 2020, they were actually low. So we had a coronavirus, you know, that shut down our economy and all the estimates were low. I don't think one strategist had an estimate that was as high as what actually happened. So if you had told these strategists at the beginning of the year, we're going to have a coronavirus, you know, they would have all lowered their estimates dramatically and we had one and they still were low. So it's just so many things happen over the course of a year that you just can't predict. So much of it, you know, is, is out of our hands that there's just no way to do this. And it's, it's not the problem of the people that are doing it. It's just, it can't be done. And so as much as I, I might do it too, if I was in that position, you know, it, as an investor, we just have to look at it and say, I can't put much value in this. So that's the summary for this week. Um, we hope you guys enjoyed that quick little discussion. If you'd like to keep up on the research, writing, and curation we're doing at Validia, please go to blog.validia.com to learn more and stay updated. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. Thanks. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.